And uh, record. Day two, awesome. take 420. Yeah. Yeah, no, for real. Yeah, it's been so many times that we try to make this work, and it was actually the best of all the recorded podcasts, hands down. The podcast that we did do that ended up messing up the way that it did. But we talked about something very, very interesting, which was the combination of DXM with THC. Just so you know, I'm not um, talking about any other form of THC other than THC that you know of that gets you high from the cannabis. That, yeah, there was uh, some s- sort of a comment you were asking about what type of THC, like you didn't know there was a Delta 9 THC or something, but. Yeah, during one of my live streams, uh, my live Q&A series, one of my fans had brought that up, but I don't know anything about Delta 9 THC. I've The only research that I've done into it is what they were telling me. Well, I, I can tell you this much. You'll actually be way better off using the cannabis bud versus the concentrated THC that I'm sure is going to be enjoyable in its own way. But it's just not the same without the terpenes that's naturally occurring in can, uh, cannabis plants. Yeah, man, I'm just so old fashioned whenever it comes to cannabis. I mean, give me a bong and some good weed and I'm good to go. And see, it, it, the reason why it's like that is because the other um, components of cannabis, the terpenes, like mercine, for example, it, seem, um, it seems to actually interact with the endocannabinoid system. And that's like a whole different area right there that I wanted to get into also where you basically have your naturally occurring forms of THC, the anandamide endocannabinoid as well as the uh, two arachidonal glycerol. Yeah, see, I don't know all those big words, man. (laughs) Oh, well, look, dude. I know, I know I make myself seem like it, it's real too complex for anyone else to even understand like what kind of a level I'm on. Well, you're like, very passionate about the topic. Therefore, yeah. you've done a lot of research into it and you're very educated on that topic. So you are pretty much one of the primary people that I would personally go to if I have any questions on this particular type of topic on. Yes, uh, I there's a lot of stuff that I do know, but whenever I act like I'm the legit source of knowledge and my commenters see that if they're like trying to correct me, which is technically their job as an audience for a self harm uh, reduction channel is to correct me if I'm making any sort of mistake. Cause it, it's not about how I look, it's about the message at hand. But anyway, like if they're seeing me over here, like thinking I'm the source of all legit knowledge. There's only so much that anybody can know, you know? We all are limited in knowledge in some form or fashion. There's stuff that I can learn from people that I didn't even know about that could be considered just as knowledgeable as the stuff found in my research that I talk about. You know, I don't, I don't want to put myself up as though I'm just an egotistical, narcissistic type. But at the same time, if you don't take yourself enough seriously. If if you take yourself too seriously, then you'll come off as a fool. But if you take yourself seriously enough, then you're just a teacher. Yeah, the thing is, um, if you didn't have confidence in how knowledgeable you were then you, I mean people just wouldn't take you seriously because I mean if you don't think you're any legitimate source of knowledge then how do you expect anyone else to believe that yeah and see that is one thing that I think a lot of people don't understand about DMT infinity I'm 
I'm a teacher to some degree, but I'm an artist. I don't just make videos about psychedelics. I do everything from let's plays to tutorials, to short films, to animation skits, to live streams, to vlogs. I, I try to bring all of the genres of YouTube together into one single uh, YouTube channel. So even though that my channel is called DMT Infinity, I'm not primarily just some dude who talks about psychedelics. It is a passion of mine, but that isn't the only thing that I do. And I know that there are a lot of YouTubers that stick to just like one or two genres, but I'm just not into that. Ever since I first started YouTube, whenever I was 12 years old, I just like doing what I love. And if I want to do something, I'll do it. It doesn't matter if it fits within the normal um of, of video types that I've made up to that point. I just like doing shit that I'm passionate about. See, I find it real interesting how I'm able to remember certain specific things, but not as well other things. Sometimes my ability to absorb information just has this barrier in front of it. In fact, I would even consider myself attention deficit, which basically has to do with dopamine deficiency in some region of your brain and that's why they have to put people on stimulants that directly release dopamine because otherwise you just don't have that improvement in short-term memory because that's just like the only way that you can actually fix it with that quick fix that say a substance like propyl hexatrin would provide a very useful legal over-the-counter stimulant in fact you know you could probably just stock up on that kind of stuff uh, but wouldn't cannabis just be a good replacement for that oh you know what you're right about this much thc is actually used to treat attention deficit disorder as well and it definitely has its place as an ADD medication, but, you know, for some reason, a lot of people think it doesn't help people with ADD. In fact, it would do the opposite is what a lot of people believe just because they don't understand um, that substances don't affect all people the same way how a substance like THC would affect somebody with attention deficit disorder there would actually be improvement in short-term memory from using THC. Notable improvement, even though THC technically causes memory impairment. Well, I don't like that argument because a lot of people think that stoners are always forgetting shit. And to some degree, they do, but they're losing their train of thought. But if they have a good reference point to what they were talking about, they can remember exactly what they were talking about because yep. there's so much going on inside of their head that most of it is getting stored to the subconscious, but it's still there. It doesn't yeah. go away. Compared to any other substance besides the stimulants that directly release dopamine release the way that they do. In other words, I'm just gonna say it, it has to be in the same league as something like methamphetamine or amphetamine, you know, to, last all day the necessary dopamine release in order for the short-term memory to be improved without any sort of memory impairment as long as you are caught up on sleep as long as you're caught up on sleep and um it's actually very doable you don't have that type of memory impairment that you find with thc but you you hear about people like making these uh, stereotypes about meth heads like they're just mindless zombies or some shit like they there's just no way that uh like they have their head together in any sort of way after taking what's a stim i don't it's think that that is the problem with methamphetamine i've known enough meth heads to know that it's a pretty fucked up drug and i've seen meth take some of the most purest most beautiful souls i've ever met and turn them into absolute monsters it's connected to a realm that Benadryl is too. It's not the same, but it brings about the shadow people, the demons, gets you closer to that kind of realm than 
even you know some of the strongest psychedelics it can um because it, it it's not really manifesting the mind when you get into that state of delirium the way that you do it's just straight up psychosis it can of course it can cause psychosis drug induced psychosis that could possibly even be permanent you know some people develop schizophrenia not until like age 25 or something for some reason just because their genetics change a little bit it's weird how that works i think that every human being is at least a little schizophrenic some people more than others but i don't think that schizophrenia is fully understood i myself am a schizophrenic but i'm what's called a process schizophrenic oh okay that's interesting because um in one of my podcasts i asked dexman if he was possibly schizophrenic uh and he told me he wasn't of course he put himself in states of schizophrenia but i guess if it's self-induced it's not technically considered schizophrenia in the same regard in the traditional but, sense yeah since it for some reason with the these uh, schizophrenics, it's just a permanent like thing that stays that way, the schizophrenia. It does well, if you change. think about it, shamans are schizophrenics, but the thing that separates them from most other schizophrenics is the fact that they can go into those realms and then come back into what we call normal reality and actually render it all into coherent vocabulary or art or something else they are in tune with those worlds but they're not completely fucking bananas mm -hmm. and um the thing about schizophrenia it's treatable but to say it's curable would be understanding i would never want to be cured of quote unquote cured of my schizophrenia i couldn't see my life not being schizophrenic oh yeah i mean there there's people that get it at such a young age it's like they, they they've just always known that their mind is always going to be that way. yeah i mean it's treatable to an extent they find that with schizophrenics they tend to have too much dopamine release and they've found that in certain cases of schizophrenia if they antagonize the D2 dopamine receptor, then that specific dopamine receptor seems to regulate schizophrenia for some reason. So we got one little factor that's, you know, in the mix. Um, but for people to have just the schizophrenia gene just like pop up the way that it does, um, makes you wonder like what would just start triggering your brain to start releasing more dopamine and just change the complete neurological makeup the way that it was originally like just because your mind like basically mixes with substances a certain way in which yeah it's it gets deep it gets really fucking deep you know yeah and i mean everybody reacts to being schizophrenic differently like you have some people who have such uncontrollable delusions that they that that they can't even live a normal life so they're usually put into fucking uh crazy houses but if these exact same people were in an aboriginal or traditional society where they have shamans then they would be taken under the wings of shamans and they would be given the option to actually undergo shamanic rituals that involve ayahuasca so that they could actually uh, what's the word that i'm looking for so they could actually control, for lack of a better term, their schizophrenia and no longer be in the state of delusion where they are going completely fucking psychotic, but instead they could actually do something with it to help their society and they could make art and they could provide groundbreaking ideas or give groundbreaking ideas to their society to transform it. Well, yeah, of course they're, they're by no means under the same classification as mentally retarded. In fact, a lot of geniuses seem to be schizophrenic. You know, it's basically a, a much more active mind, even though it seems to fry your brain from having it in overdrive mode for 
so much of the time. And uh, it seems like, and it, this is why I think that in a lot of cases, schizophrenia, um, it, it seems like it synergizes well with the DXM chemical in particular, because I know when I was putting myself in a state of psychosis, drug-induced psychosis, mind you, and I did it so many times. I was thinking, I'm just going to have schizophrenia. I never do. I never fucking do. But um, anyway, when I was putting myself in the state of psychosis with Benadryl, the DXM did a tremendous job of taking away the fear aspect. I would recommend it to people to mix with psychedelics just to take away the fear aspect of, that would be associated more so with your classic hallucinogen psychedelic. So is DXM a psychedelic or is it just a psychoactive compound? Oh, it's technically a psychedelic. I mean, if you want to look at how psychedelics are defined, it's from how they interact with that area of your brain that filters perception. There's like a connection that's made to your prefrontal cortex and that gets inhibited. So you don't filter your perception as much and you have perceptions that mix into other perceptions. So it's cross-sensory perception, including enhancement of perception. I mean, why else wouldn't, I mean, sorry, why else would they call it psychedelic after all? Excuse me, sorry. Yeah, I see what you mean. And I think that that is one of the biggest things that comes with schizophrenics in general. I think that schizophrenia only becomes a hindrance to the person whenever they cannot differentiate uh, uh, different realities. But whenever they're able to tap into other realities and then bring that back into this reality, then that is whenever it can actually become a tool for personal, spiritual, or social transformation. Yeah, and see, schizophrenics, they're also more connected to, besides delirium, of course, which is, I think, a different type of schizophrenia, you know, I mean, there's schizophrenics that can separate the two realities. They're exactly. aware of what are the hallucinations, just like they would be able to, let's say, if they were to take LSD, and they know that they're tripping the whole time. It's just a trip, it's just a mind trip. Nothing can hurt them. But no matter how strong-minded you are, Benadryl, if it's just taken by itself, it's gonna get you every single time, that fear aspect. It's just gonna get you every single time. And that's why I say DX it does such a tremendous job of treating anxiety and fear that's brought about by certain uh, trips using certain specific more stimulant like psychedelics that the type of psychedelics that would excite a certain part of your brain that could be associated with fear but with the dextrothorphin chemical somehow from its physically depressing qualities that's specific to NMDA antagonist dissociatives it takes away that fear aspect, but it also does the same particular type of psychedelia, which would be categorized as dissociation, as salvia. And salvia seems salvia to- Salvia is fucking fear. crazy, man. It always puts people in such a, a, a fearful state of mind. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, people can do that with even just your regular dissociatives that actually get you euphoria instead of with salvia it's just like no euphoria attached to it but it's you know it can be quite a profound experience though oh i mean yeah it's basically just dabbling around in a different reality a form of reality that i like to call the thought reality where literally anything imagined is possible within this reality so when people say you create your own reality in a way you kind of do it's and it's like inward you know it's like you're getting inside your brain 
Yeah, everything out here is actually in here. Everything out here is a projection of what is in your mind. LSD taught me that a long time ago. Uh, I, yeah, I think that, well, there is a collective consciousness, of course, and there seems to be a lot of reports of how realities are uh, also a current with other individuals that experience yeah, they're all intertwined yeah like let's say a person trips with another person and they have a specific hallucination that two of the people there see but let's say the trip sitter doesn't see what's being seen is it, it not is, it is because those two people tripping are in tuned while their consciousness are both of their consciousnesses are in tune with one another and seeing the exact same thing because they're both in tune into in into that perspective of reality. Here's the thing. You you technically um, make it real with how your brain is already um, set up to begin with. It's almost like we were meant to use our mind that way because of when being younger, that part of the brain that filters perception, that psychedelics like classic hallucinogens and dissociatives seem to make a little less active. Like as a kid, your imagination is so active and you're able to imagine things so effectively. You know. Your uh your stream is cutting out. I can't hear you. Are you getting <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. I can't hear you. Okay. All right. The call came in just now. Can you hear oh, me now? Okay. Yeah, I can hear can you. you. Okay. Um, well, I want to end the podcast uh, somewhat pretty soon because there was uh, something that I wanted to touch on that that would be really important. And uh, there's been, you know, preparations made or, or something and calls are coming in so i just thought i'd talk about the combination of dxm with thc it seems that they find with a, a certain particular pharmaceutical called eldoprinol it extends life expectancy or has the potential to on average for up to 50 percent um for up to 50 percent longer um in rodents on average and of course, you know, rodents are rodents and humans are humans, but it seems to be from specifically how dopamine hits a certain particular part of the brain responsible for voluntary movement. And this area of the brain is less active in cases of Parkinson's where they have those shakes, you know? And there's videos where people, they'll smoke a joint and the Parkinson's shakes, they just dissipate, they just go away. Yep, and in fact, people who have had seizures, they can treat that with uh, with uh, CBD and THC. Yeah, and uh, for some reason, when you mix dopamine-releasing substances with these NMDA glutamate antagonists, it actually potentiates the accumulation of dopamine and potentiates the dopamine release associated with it. so that might be accessing what's already put into place as long as you don't take too much DXM with the THC, but it seems to make the medicinal value for cases of Parkinson's more effective, I would say. But then you get into a point where it just could cause these tremors in such a very, very significant way. Although I don't know if that's just part of being on the DXM trip, you know, or if the THC has just something about it that when it's mixed with DXM, it can just, it can cause these very- Well, they seem to potentiate one another psychoactive effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the dopamine release is potentiated by an MD, sorry, uh, NMD antagonist that actually regulates dopamine release. So it may basically 
the dopamine the dopamine that you would release from THC, like it would make it to where it would accumulate more and it can directly interact with how dopamine gets broken down with MAOB inhibitors. I'm thinking that if it's a potent MAOA inhibitor, it's a lot more likely to be an MAOB inhibitor. I don't know if that's like, you know, always the case, but I know curcumin is known to be a very potent um, MAO a inhibitor, just like the serine root seeds that they mix in with the ayahuasca brew. So the, make- you could use that and also use something like mimosa hostilis, and then the mimosa hostilis would be, well, the DMT would become orally active? Yes, I'm saying that. I believe curcumin, from, based on how it also works as an MAOA inhibitor, it could, it could be just as effective since it is powerful in its MAOA inhibiting properties to make the DMT a lot more bioavailable like the Syrian root seeds would, but possibly also counteract a lot of toxicity. In the I much prefer the Banisteriopsis capybon. One, because it seems to be a lot more healing, but two, it goes down a lot easier. The Syrian root seeds taste like, taste like fucking shit, man. I cannot handle that taste. Oh, uh, yeah. See, that's another factor to think about. Just the taste. The, maybe it's just the aftertaste that's got you feeling nauseated. Well, it tastes and smells like grinded down uh, morning glory seeds or something. Um, hmm. You know, that reminds me that morning glory seeds, when ordered through a certain vendor, and it wasn't like what you find in the stores that's got the pesticides on it, it's actually pretty clean from my experience. Yeah, you can uh, get them all organic. Yeah, it, it's actually not that toxic. So that's uh, that's another um, thing you could add for your quote unquote sorcery, you know. And uh, a lot of people, they, they wanna discredit like what drug users are doing to access certain states of mind. It's like, you know, I don't think I can technically call it real, but I feel like it's there for a reason, you know? I feel like there's a reason why we're able to access these certain states. Well, I personally think they are real. I just think that people tend to call things and other realities not real because it's not something that we can physically interact with. But I do, sorry, so something that popped over my screen. I think that there are an infinite amount of realities and that we literally do live in an infinite multiverse and that three dimensional space and time is only one of an infinite amount of realities. So whenever our consciousness is altered, we're able to experience one of the other infinite realities or more. Uh-huh. Um, so I think that it is all real. It's just not something that I can pick up like this lighter because it's not made of matter yeah and it makes you wonder how matter comes from an absence of matter like gravity for example the pulling force it just comes from dark matter matter that doesn't even exist yet before it comes into existence well matter is energy energy cannot be created nor destroyed only transformed or transferred so technically And, and whenever a human being dies the energy is released from their body. It just seems to disappear. So the question is, where does that energy go if it cannot be transformed? I mean, if it cannot be created or transformed? I think what is happening is that whenever you die, that energy, which I also call consciousness, is transcendentalized to a higher state of being. So we go into a higher reality. Yeah, and you know, when you put yourself in this sort of state, you're actually very clear-headed through the experience. I mean, you know what you're experiencing. I mean, there there's no way that you're completely out of it, like you would be in a blackout, so to speak. You know, it's like you're not even, um, it, I mean, it, it's like you're not even in any sort of impaired state to begin with. But rather the state of mind that forms new realities and then gets that that stuff mixed in with the current reality that you're in 
And, you know, like you said, dark matter can't be created. So there's no origin to it. It all comes from what becomes after is like where the source is, is where everything ends to begin creating more of an end as it is all ending. It's always in forward motion, like you said, since it can't be created. And that makes you wonder, yeah, I mean, well, of course it's infinite. Um, you know, it, it's just uh, one of those things that make, makes you really think like stuff that technically doesn't even exist is what creates existence. Everything that you can't even like, you, I mean, you can't even measure it in any sort of physical way, like thoughts, for example, thoughts, not physical, but we consider them real. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's getting into the, the realm of, it's not delirium, right? Because you're actually aware of yourself as you're in the experience, but at the same time, I guess you're not aware of yourself, right? It's almost like you, maybe you form a form of yourself within that state of dementia, uh, sorry, dimension, not dimension. Um, and and uh, you, you, you tap into old memories, like from maybe a past life or something. It makes you wonder, like, why are those memories there? Like, maybe these memories are not even true, but we get access to them. Like, wait, I remember something from another life. Why? How? I don't know. That's the question. Where does it all come from? And then it gets back to what you were saying before about how matter, dark matter cannot be created. So it all comes from nothing. Well, well energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transformed or transferred. Um, yeah, I mean, the energy, the energy part um, that, that basically goes into dark energy, which is the, I mean. Oh, I see you know the pulling force that puts everything into existence yeah. um yeah I mean, I mean it all comes from the end but it, it's kind of like that smashing pumpkins uh song title the end is the beginning is the end like i've only heard one of their songs the lead singer has a pretty beautiful voice man yeah yeah i, I think that you know, he can hit vocals really good. You know, he's got a, a whole very wide range, you know. Um, Have you ever listened to Tool? I tried getting into Tool. I really did. And, you know, I just, for some reason, I never really got into it. They're I not for work. everybody. But they are a pretty uh, fascinating band. Okay, I got, I got one more thing, actually, I want to talk about real quick. Uh, and then we'll just end the podcast real quick. Uh, oh, God, I got to remember. Um, Oh yeah, THC, I've actually proven in my experiments, prevents mental decline that induces a state of delirium more effectively than any other substance that I had added into the mix when I was uh, testing out del deliriums and how they would induce delirium. Maybe there's like specific forms of delirium, you know, where you trigger the hallucination of the spiders, the DPH that or whatever it is, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite something. It's, um, it's almost like it's made that way by design. Like there's a whole system devoted to what THC does specifically because it just works the way it's supposed to, you know, like, like, you know, been, not, not related, but uh -huh. still talking about cannabis. I hate the argument whenever people say say one of the two things. Cannabis makes people lazy and unproductive. But then you have the other side of the coin where they're like, no, it is. it can actually make you more creative and all of that, blah, blah, blah. I hate both of those arguments because everybody's different. You can be an unproductive stoner that does nothing but sit on the couch, eat junk food and watch TV all day. But you yeah. can, or you can also be a 
productive, artistic, hardworking stoner that eats healthy and works out. Not everybody's the same. Yeah, and you know, that's another thing that people need to think about whenever they're using THC, because there are people that are actually allergic to THC. And it- Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, it would make you wonder like, why is it that it seems to be so medicinal in just the right way when it's not meant for everyone? like the people that apparently with their allergy endocannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, whenever they smoke THC, they just throw up projectile vomiting. And Do some um, of those people also black out? Um, I, I, I don't think like they really get the, the type of effects like that would register. And I, I feel like it's, it's something and this is just a guess, but I think it's something outside of the cannabinoid receptor activity, because I feel like they don't even get the psychoactive effects that register, like whenever they get the projectile vomiting that's like telling them, I don't, I should not have this in my system. I don't. It's I kind don't. of funny because human beings naturally have cannabinoids in their brain. Yeah, exactly. So. Of course, there's got to be like some kind of um, measurement you could do to see exactly what's like the right type of activation. But apparently, um, there's just something that's not registering for them. And I could be wrong by by saying this because I, I don't know if they just don't experience any psychoactive effects when they throw up and it like gets out of their system before it even registers. Um, I feel like. I don't know. There's no high attached to the people that are just allergic to cannabis. Do you think those same people would react the same way to like edibles or dabs or vaping pure concentrated THC? You know, what's, what's really weird is that THC is one of the most powerful anti-nausea med- medications that it, it does a tremendous job of making it for a lot of people to where you're physically incapable of throwing up because your brain can't register nausea from how it specifically cuts off acetylcholine release. So you can't even, can't even register nausea, but apparently people that are allergic to THC get nauseated from the THC. That's supposed to make it to where they're physically incapable of getting nausea. Yeah, I mean, that is one reason why I like to smoke weed whenever I drink one too many beers. Yeah, and um, DPH is a similar case where it can be very, very powerful, just as powerful as THC for preventing nausea and or vomiting. But for some reason, you know, you take a shit ton of DPH, your body is somehow able to throw it back up even though it's supposed to cut off the connections to where you're not physically able to throw up there are some people that actually have that condition where they're physically incapable of throwing up all like they like the people that don't know what pain is because their body doesn't register pain apparently for some reason Uh, that's terrible I would hate to be one of those kind of people because even though that pain hurts like a bitch, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. You have to know when you're hurt or two. Um, like, you know, yeah, you just, uh, too hurt. Like, um, what was going to tell you? <clears throat> Dang. I got to think about this. For any of you who haven't seen it yet and are into Magic the Gathering, then y'all can go over to DMT Infinity or YouTube.com slash DMT Infinity and check out my Magic the Gathering random unboxing where I unbox these two packs right here. I'm actually very fond of one card in this deck called Peer into the Abyss. It has a stupid ass effect where it causes the target player to draw half of their deck and lose half of their life. Fucking crazy, man. Mm. shameless self-promotion out of the way yeah okay i got it now i was going to talk about how dxm apparently prevents laughter like some Mm. muscle associated with laughter interestingly imagine if you were just physically incapable of laughing you know 
I guess that kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm not sure if I ever like laugh my ass off while under the effects of DXM, but the few experiences that I have had, I do seem to be like in a very like, like not like depressed state, but like a very down kind of uh, mindset where like, I'm like so hyper-focused that I'm not emotionally attached to anything. It, it's a, when you get into the state of mind, it's not as emotional of an experience as your classic hallucinogen would be. Although you're very in tune with feelings of empathy and understanding emotional intelligence, but it seems like from some sort of disconnect but yeah, okay. you're not reacting to it, but you can understand it and fit and, and, and feel it to some degree. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I say, you know, DXM can prevent people from laughing is because it's actually given to people that are diagnosed with uncontrollable laughter crying syndrome. The, uh, like the dude, I mean, like, uh, Arthur had in the Joker movies. Exactly. Yes. Uh, DXM is combined with quinidine to give people that for that specific reason the um muting of the laugh somehow somehow i guess it's just specifically dxm that has some relation with that but i wonder what other substances would work as effectively if at all but um yeah i mean it's um yeah, it's new Dexta. It's uh, given to people, and it keeps them from laughing from specifically pseudo bulbar effect, but also apparently does that with the laughs created by laughing gas. So apparently there's some connection there. I'm thinking with how nitrous oxide would cause laughter versus pseudo bulbar effect, some correlation there that is interacted the same way with the DXM. And it's just weird. How just, old were you whenever you first smoked weed? Oh, 18. Mm, I was 12. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave for, for now because uh, I wanna check on some things, uh, see how everything, you know, like just uh, send me a link of the, the, the podcast download file and, uh, absolutely and, yeah. yeah all right everybody that'll be it for this video i hope that you all enjoyed it if y'all did leave it a like subscribe to psych tripper 666 and subscribe to dmt infinity and hit that bell notification button and as always i'm your host dmt infinity and this is psych psych tripper 666 i hope you enjoyed peace